damn late. I had to stop by the Wax Museum again and give the finger to FDR. We know Al-Qaeda, Zawahiri, is supporting the opposition in Syria. Are we supporting Al-Qaeda in Syria? Well, it's a proud day for America. And by God, we've kicked Vietnam Syndrome once and for all. Thank you very, very much. I say it, I say it again, you've been had. You've been took. You've been hoodwinked. These witnesses are trying to simply deny things that just about everybody else accepts as fact. He came, he saw, he died. <laughs> well, we ain't killing their army, but we killing them. We be on CNN like, say our name, Ben, say it, say it three times. The meeting of the largest armies in the history of the world. Then there's going to be an invasion. Hey guys, check it out. I got Bob Murphy on the line. He's a senior fellow at Mises. Uh, that's the Ludwig von Mises Institute, Mises.org. They do the Austrian school extremely, all the way, free market economics, you might say. Uh, and he wrote The Politically Incorrect Guide to Capitalism and The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Great Depression and the New Deal. Oh, boy, I love those books so much. They're good. And he also wrote a ton of other things, and he has a show. He has two shows. He has a show with Tom Woods called Contra Krugman. And he has a show that's called The Bob Murphy Show, which you can find at, I don't know the URL, but all of them are also at Mises.org. And uh, yeah, welcome back to the show. How you doing, man? Thanks for having me, Scott. Uh, it was a pleasure to do it. Yeah, man. Happy to have you here. And I'm sorry, uh, tell me the website, right, for where people can find The Bob Murphy Show? It's BobMurphyShow.com. That's pretty hard to remember. Say it one more time. <laughs> BobMurphyShow.com. All right, cool. Hey, I'm happy to have you on today because... Um, yeah, I'm just tired of talking about Gaza and everything. I didn't take a break for a minute and talk about this global warming stuff. So you have this interesting thing here. I like the take um, because uh, what you're doing here is you're saying that, you know, never mind your opinion or this or that thing, but take for granted the narrative of the most qualified of the climate change people. Um, this is what shall be done in order to save us and that by their own standards, the things that they want to do will not work and, uh, well, this and that and the other things. So I just thought it was interesting to talk about. I actually don't know much about the so-called or the actual science behind this at all. And I do know that essentially with very few exceptions, all ideological capitalists and conservatives don't believe in it and everyone to the left of them does and that's essentially the division so um hopefully us libertarians try to be a little bit more objective and less partisan um but i want to know uh, what all you have to say about um well explain this piece what universities won't teach college students about the economics of climate change okay sure so yeah i'll uh I'll just say some stuff. You just guide me through the conversation, Scott, because obviously, you know, this is something I could talk a lot about. So primarily in my capacity, I'm the senior economist with the Institute for Energy Research or IER. That's a think tank, um, the free market energy think tank. With the, the beat they've had me on, let's see, geez, more than a decade now, I think, is this the economics of climate change. And so, you know, I, I really have um, gone into this area. And so I want to stipulate up front, just for your listeners who might be, you know, on their guard, absolutely nothing that I'm going to say in this has anything to do with challenging what the so-called consensus is in terms of what climate scientists say. So I'm not challenging, you know, the physics or the chemistry behind this stuff. And in fact, a lot of the, you know, statistics or facts that I'll give you here, Scott, they're not coming from the Heritage Foundation or from some maverick scientist, you know, at a second tier institution who's got his own theory about cloud formation. This is all stuff from either the UN directly or the climate models from William Nordhaus, who just won the Nobel Prize. And, or from, and, and by the way, Nordhaus's model was one of the three that the Obama administration selected when they were coming up with what's called the social cost of carbon. Okay. So what, what I'm doing here, and this is the talk I gave to these college kids, is I'm just showing if you actually go in and read these reports, what they they say do not at all justify the the political goals 
that are being trotted out as, you know, oh, this is what we need to do now. Okay, so, th so that's really the my main um, message from this particular talk that I gave you referencing. It was at Connecticut College, and I gave a presentation. And yeah, there I wasn't, you know, I, as you know, Scott, you know, I'm, I'm philosophically opposed to the federal government, and I have views on that stuff, but this has nothing to do with that stuff. This is just saying if you go and dive into this research and this literature, you'll see that what people are, you know, banding about, like, you know, oh, we got to at least have a two degree Celsius limit on warming. And ideally, we'd like to keep it closer to 1.5 C. Just to give you an example of what I mean, the standard results in the literature on this, again, from the guy who just won the Nobel Prize, is that doing that, if we could somehow pursue that goal, that would cause humanity far more damage economically than doing, quote, nothing about climate change whatsoever. And it's not even close. Like, they're not even in the same ballpark as to, as to how drastic that would be. So that's just one example of what I mean here, where the, the, the published literature on this stuff does not at all support what everyone is treating as, oh, this is the settled science, and if you doubt this, you must be in the pay of big oil or something. Yeah. Well, in fact, so that was my thing. I want to deconstruct you one more second here before I let you go uh, on that, which is – uh, you said, of course, ideologically, I'm extremely libertarian, this kind of thing. But what people also might be suspicious of is that this Institute for Energy, Energy Research is just a front for Coke oil. Is that right? Or anybody else? Texo, Texco or Exxon? Or So they, again, I, I'm not on the fundraising side. They, big quote, big oil does not, to my knowledge, support this stuff, partly for PR reasons, but also like Exxon, for example, I think a while ago they they decided oh carbon tax is coming and so they got into like natural gas so Exxon now funds you know middle of the road things that support mm -hmm. a quote a price on carbon and it's funny the 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 thing the tables flip so now people who are pro intervention will say even Exxon recognizes right. now you know what I mean so it's like if it, if they support them then it just shows how obvious it is right. and if they're against them it just shows because they're corrupt and look so, yeah and it yeah. doesn't follow that if you have a job then that means that you're just you know a billboard uh saying what you're being paid to say I know you and I like you and and I trust your motives but uh people have the right and in fact the duty to be very skeptical of right. uh things that you say especially controversial ones so I just want to you right. know and, and that again, that's that's why I'm saying so like, yeah, if if I were saying, oh, I did my own model here or some, you know, some computer study that was published and funded by, you know, Peabody Cole or so. Yeah, that would that you might say, I don't trust that stuff. But here again, I mean, you know, we have links and I have screenshots. This is all again, this is not coming from me. This is and it's not like my esoteric interpretation. When you look at these charts and things that people click through to the article, you can see. This is quite clearly what Nordhaus's model says. You know, I'm quoting from the Obama administration's results. So again, this it's you'd have to know where to go find it. That's the thing, is it gets buried yeah. in you know. All right. And again, the main point here is the incongruity between what the climate scientists say is the problem and what must be done and the proposals of what must be done. But it sounds like just from the beginning there, before you've had a chance to state your case, that maybe they should do even more. But you're saying what? No. Oh, because of the cost. Yeah. So specifically, I mean, so we probably should just deal with this head on. There are plenty of people, you know, in the natural sciences who like study whatever coral reefs or something, you know, like, oh, the, you know, the ecological diversity in the oceans. And they would be very concerned about climate change and warn all these things are going to happen. And that's why, you know, we need to drastically s slow down emissions and that sort of thing. And if we don't, you know, really go to net zero emissions by this particular date, bad things will happen. And so that's all fine. But you, again, you need to have some basis to say, well, what are, what are the, the drawbacks? What are the costs of your recommendations? And so that's unavoidably an economics question. So it doesn't mean the economists who publish in this are gods or, you know, in infallible. But my point is you can't just look at People saying, oh, it would really be much better if we slowed the rate of emissions without saying, well, what are the downsides of that? And, and that so that's the thing where the, you know, the, the standard economic studies in this area show that, yes, I mean, the, the standard economist who publishes this says unchecked climate change will be bad. And they recommend a modest carbon tax, for example, is the best way for governments to deal with it. But my point is their recommendations would still allow something like 3.5 degrees Celsius of warming. And for people, I mean, I know to like the average outsider who's not familiar with this debate that that's meaningless, but that is way beyond what 
the standard activist who's, you know, clamoring for we need to do something quickly here or our grandkids are all dead. That's way beyond the limit. They think 2C is the absolute most we should allow. And that, you know, if you said, what about 3.5C, they'd say that's crazy. You know, Earth would be uninhabitable or, you know, that's the kind of language they would use. And I'm saying that's that's unsupported. That that apocalyptic rhetoric is just not in the standard literature here. And, and so it's my I guess partly the irony, Scott, is for a while, as I'm sure you knew, anybody who challenged the standard, you know, view as to the political intervention, the necessity of this was just beat, you know, browbeat and said, oh, you got to you know, look at the consensus. You're a denier. And so I'm saying it's weird here where when I go and I quote from the U.N.'s own documents about the expected costs of climate change and the expected benefits of dealing with it and show, you know, it's kind of a wash here in terms of, again, quoting from the U.N.'s own reports mm -hmm. to say, like, a particular climate goal will, will spare humanity this much in damage from climate change, but it will cause this much in slower economic growth. And using their own numbers, it's about a wash at mm -hmm. least under the middle of the road projections and the pushback will be, well, yeah, but those models, models leave a lot of stuff out. And, and I'm sure they do. I mean, you know, computers simulating the economy and the climate for the next 300 years, of course it leaves stuff out. But my point is all of a sudden the rhetoric flipped from you need to go look at the published literature, you deniers to, well, the published literature leaves a lot of stuff out. So yeah. th that's what I'm saying is like the, the, the goalposts keep shifting and these aggressive goals, it's not merely that it's hard to support them, that the standard results in the literature would say, for example, the UN's goal that they announced last fall of 1.5 C Celsius of warming, and that's the target we should shoot for. Let's see if we can contain warming to that level. The guy who won the Nobel Prize the same week that UN report came out, his own work shows that would be catastrophically damaging to humanity's welfare. That would be far worse than doing nothing. So you know, you can quibble with it, but it's just weird that like the same New York Times article that reported William Nordhaus winning the Nobel Prize for his work on the economics of climate change and also mentioning the U.N. special report on how governments can try to limit warming to 1.5 C. You'd think there'd be at least one sentence in there saying, oh, by the way, the guy who just won the Nobel Prize, his model shows the U.N.'s target would be catastrophically bad. But nothing like that. They act like they support each other. Like this just shows the growing recognition of how serious this issue is. Mm -hmm when you know so sorry hang on just one second for me hey guys you know what you ought to do buy my book fool's errand time to end the war in afghanistan it's endorsed by ron paul daniel ellsberg patrick coburn colonel douglas mcgregor matthew ho and daniel davis gareth porter and anon gopal they thought it was good you can get it in paperback, of course, at Amazon.com. You can also get the Kindle and the EPUB is available at Barnes & Noble and all over the place. And if you want to hear the audiobook version, it's read by me. And you can get that by following the link to Audible.com in the left-hand margin at ScottHorton.org. And if you sign up for Audible, you get your first book free. So do that. And what's really nice is if you stay a member of Audible after that, I get a kickback from them. So uh, check all that out. Fool's Errand. Time to end the war in Afghanistan. Hot links for you in the left-hand margin at scotthorton.org or go to foolserrand.us. Okay, but so now some things aren't really calculated in, in uh, prices exactly. Like, for example, the future of coral reefs and ecosystems and the food chain on the planet that sustains us all. And so maybe we all do have to tighten our belts a little bit in order to, uh, you know, in other words, uh, if the costs are a little bit higher for driving the, or preventing the temperature from going even as high as one and a half degrees or whatever it is, um, maybe whatever the cost would be worth it for the long term or not whatever, but maybe a much higher cost than just, what it would cost people in monetary uh, productivity, you know, as measured by GDP or what have you going forward in the same time period. Right. And, and I totally get that. And certainly, you know, I mean, and this is, as you know, Scott, like an Austrian Does that make economist. me a one world communist? <laughs> oh, it, it raises, it raises. Privatize the oceans immediately. That's the only option. Go ahead. I'm I mean, we, I mean, if you want to get into that later, yeah. I mean, I think that is the, ultimately the way to deal with this stuff, but um, it's so, so yes, I, I, again, I'm in an awkward position here where I've written, you know, journal critiques or critique. It's a journal. Well, no, two of them, at least critiques of the kind of model that William Nordhaus does because Nord to be clear, I don't want to mislead or, you know, have your listeners take away the wrong thing. 
guys like William Nordhaus are for a carbon tax. The average economist, if you just grabbed him and asked him, what do we do about climate change, would say, oh, yeah, there's a negative externality. People are emitting you know, CO2 and other greenhouse gases, and they're not taking that into account. And so the government should levy a, a tax on that to bring private you know, behavior into conformity with you know, what promotes the social good. My point is just the the magnitude of it. It's a it's like leaning against the wind is what the economics you know result would pop out and say. And so for I am against that because of you know public public choice reasons and philosophical ones. I don't trust the government to do what the guys in the white lab coats recommend. I think you give the government a new tax, they're going to go to town with it, and they don't really you know I don't trust the guys running governments around the world to be you know, sitting up at night worried about climate change. So, but those are separate things. So here I'm I'm not saying. That yes, because William Nordhaus's model says something that's gospel, but it, it it's it's more it's way more nuanced than I think the average person thinks when they hear about oh cost benefit in terms of dollars. It's not saying oh sure uh, you know we're gonna lose coral reefs and 16 percent of the Bangladesh population is gonna die early because of you know heat stroke and whatever there be or, or sea level rise and we're gonna displace millions of people and agriculture is gonna be changed. But you know measured GDP is gonna go down only by such and such percentage. That's not what they're saying. When they quantify the, quote, costs of climate change damage, they're putting in a lot of those non-market things and they're coming up with estimates. And so certainly mm-hmm. somebody can look at what they did and, and challenge it and say, nah, I think you guys are you know, downplaying this issue or whatever. But it's it, it's it's much more – it includes a lot more than I think the average critic would believe. It's not merely looking at like official GDP growth. It's, it's throwing in a lot of non-market stuff with proxies like, well, how do you quantify or value – those sorts of things. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's more, and again, it, but the, the point is that they went, when, you know, Nordhaus tries to pull those, he went to the literature and looked at that stuff. So it's, it's, it's sort of, it's, again, it's this irony where the original claim was you science deniers need to go look at the peer reviewed literature and stop just making up stuff. So I am going to the peer reviewed. I'm taking the best estimates. Again, the one that's in the UN zone documents as to here are the best estimates of the cost of climate change damage, the, the very ones they, the UN cited in the what's called the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. If you go and look at the chapter under the, you know, the estimated damages, th- th- that's where I'm quoting from. I'm not going to the Heritage Foundation. And then when th- those numbers aren't catastrophic, then the critics will just come back and say, oh, yeah, well, they leave out a lot of stuff. So that's fine. But now they're the ones who are ignoring what the peer-reviewed literature says, and they're just saying stuff that, you know, isn't so – that. And also, too, let me just say this. Obviously, I can't prove, Scott, that it's not going to be a disaster by 2080. But by the same token, you know, an asteroid could hit Earth. And so I could say we need to have 20 percent of all governments around the world devoting their military budget, 20 percent of it to building space based lasers to knock out incoming asteroids. And you can't prove I'm wrong. You can't assure me that there's not going to be a killer asteroid coming along that we need to have that level of funding, but you can see the the danger there and how that's kind of non-falsifiable. Yeah. So it's a similar thing here where this is justifying, you know, just trillions of dollars of expenditures and huge new tax revenue sources in the name of something that, yeah, I can't prove that these worst case scenarios won't happen. All I can say though is the UN's own published assessment of the literature is saying probably this isn't going to be that big of a deal. It'll be manageable even under fairly pessimistic assumptions. And then when you contrast it with, okay, to deal with it, what are the, you know, what's the economic fallout? It's in the same ballpark. That's what I'm saying. The irony here that it's really so. Well, and taxation too is a matter of freedom. So it's not just the cost financially, but it's a matter of the cost from real people that changes their lives for the lack of having that money in big ways you know they talk about oh and of course that's all they can think of to do is put a new tax on for regular people um when you know as long as they're printing money they could just subsidize nuclear without adding new taxes on to coal or oil or whatever it is they could subsidize um geothermal or whatever garbage i don't know um, can, can I say something to just you spark something with nuclear? That's another thing too here again. And I know, you know, some of your listeners will be, Oh, come on, this is, you know, crazy. And the, what this guy Murphy's talking about, you know, being counter stuff again, just, this is why I don't believe the rhetoric of like some of the leaders in these movements or these, you know, public representatives, the face of the you know, green activism. So I'm not challenging the motives or 
impugning the the motivations of like the average person who's really concerned about this stuff. But I'm saying like, for example, um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and the so-called Green New Deal, within there, they explicitly say they do not support expanding nuclear power. So if you really thought that we had 12 years to change, you know, fundamentally the energy and transportation system of humanity or else it was going to spell disaster for our great grandchildren. If you really thought that, wouldn't you be willing to expand nuclear, at least in the short term? Because nuclear, of course, is emission free and it's fairly effective and it's dispatchable. You know, France uses it. It's not like it's some unproven technology. And yet they don't. And so it makes me think I don't really believe that they believe their rhetoric because yeah. if they did, they wouldn't be. It'd be like if, if you really did think, a, you know, an asteroid were coming and it was going to destroy the earth and we needed to knock it down with a laser and people said, OK, we need huge funding now for lasers and people and activists. And no, we oppose that because that interferes with our message on gun control. See, the, the problem here is all of these things are different questions, right, of the degree to which climate change is a real thing, the degree to which liberals and leftists have any idea what they're talking about. The, the degree to which the Nobel Prize winner's computer model is actually a meaningful thing, and the question of whether government should do anything about this one way or the other or anything, these are all separate things. So I'm the kind of guy, I'm like you, I'm just anti-government first. Whatever it is they want to do about anything, <laughs> I'm against it. I don't care what it is, so that's my bias as hell, and I admit that. But that doesn't really have anything to do with whether there's a problem or not. And yeah. just because I don't want to hear it doesn't mean that I shouldn't take the time to hear it. But so I wonder then, for as much work as you've put into this, are we talking about just for argument's sake and taking all of that? I mean, when you look at these computer models and you look at all of the peer reviewed this and that, I mean, essentially for a guy like me who's just, you know, way out here in the public opinion on the receiving end of all of this stuff, essentially... I'm asked to believe in it, and I'm told that if I don't believe in it, then I'm a real dummy for not believing in it. But it's science. It shouldn't. I shouldn't have to believe in it. It should be demonstrated to me somehow. And I understand mm -hmm. that computer models, they could show meaningful things like how an H-bomb detonates, right? I can't discount that, but I don't know about it. But So what do you really think about it? Okay, great. So let me just first elaborate on you know your first main point there and then I'll try to answer your question. So right, I was on my own, I was going to do this analogy and you kind of just set me up perfectly for it. For me, my view on this stuff is kind of analogous to my view on drug addiction. And so obviously as a libertarian philosophically, I'm against the US government locking people up for what I view as, you know, consensual activities. And I also so I you know, I'm for legalizing even if that meant that there'd be people, you know, falling over in the streets from massive heroin overdoses, you know, all next Thursday and half the populations like that. I would still, you know, bite the bullet and say, no, but, you know, I believe in freedom and we don't, who am I to justify putting people in cages for, you know, activities that are, are consensual. But I don't happen to believe that also, right? I think that, you know, that, that's just a pretext that, you know, it funds a prison industrial complex and, you know, gives them the, the pretext to, monitor financial transactions because, oh, we got to watch out for, you know, funneling money to cartels. And it just it's a great, convenient way for the government to expand its power and invade civil liberties. And I don't think the other like, but of course, that doesn't mean I'm saying there's no such thing as drug addiction or there's no such thing as families that are ruined, you know, by by drug abuse. Obviously, that's not what I'm saying. And, or like the war on terror, similar thing. I'm not saying terrorism doesn't exist. I'm just saying I don't trust the authorities when they use those things as a pretext to expand their power and they largely cause the problem. So similarly here, it's true. I don't think that climate change, human clause climate change is this existential threat to humanity and they need to really drastically cut emissions in the next 20 years or else that means it's hopeless and people in 2100 are going to be doomed. I don't think that. We can talk in a minute about why. But my point is even if you did believe that, having the government try to solve it is going to just make things worse. And one quick example, this Paris agreement, the stuff, you know, that, that Trump announced two years ago, he's going to pull out of people were freaking out and saying, Oh, that's, you know, humanity's now in, in trouble the, to this day. Even if you include the U S's commitment, they're nowhere close to limiting warming to two degrees Celsius. In other words, you go around and calculate all of the pledges that the countries who have signed into this Paris Agreement have made as to what they're going to do. And you say, OK, let's assume they all lived up to their pledges, which they're not on track of doing, but just assume they did. Warming still is over three degrees Celsius in terms of just looking at what they're promising to do. 
So by the you know activists' own logic and rhetoric, this Paris Agreement is still bringing us you know is on course for utter disaster. And so again, it's again it's like saying even if you really did think heroin abuse was this huge problem, saying so that's why I'm going to have Rudy Giuliani in there to really fix it. Well, that would be a non-starter. That you'd be distracting yourself. Those they're not going to solve the problem using guns and cages. And so likewise here, a political solution is not going to work, even if the problem were as bad as they're saying is. In fact, that would be distracting everybody. Clearly, these political solutions are not on track to solving the problem if it's as bad as they say. Mm-hmm. Hey, you guys, check out my institute, libertarianinstitute.org. Did you know I have one? Yeah, I do. Me and the great Sheldon Richmond. Uh, he's my partner there. It was Will Grigg, the late great Will Grigg. Uh, but his book is coming out soon. And we got a lot of great writers there. I hang out on the blog all day long. And uh, we have a lot of great podcasts as well. Myself, Mance Raider, uh, Kyle Anzalone and his great foreign policy podcast, Patrick McFarland and Keith Knight holding it down as well. Uh, check out all that stuff if you like the Libertarian podcasts and writings, libertarianinstitute.org. All right. So then go back then to the why not, though. You still don't buy it okay, either way. Sure. So, so again, so here, um, so the basic situation is the the so-called greenhouse effect. That's obvious, you know, that's standard physics and chemistry. It's it's certainly other things equal, the higher the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, you know, it lets in sunlight and it retains the heat that bounces up. So that's, you know, that's standard, just like an actual greenhouse works. But that by itself is not what's driving the, um, the catastrophic projections. And, and so, you know, standard climate scientists, they all agree on that. The, where the disagreement is in the so-called feedback effects. And so the idea is as the planet gets warmer, does it do things that induce further warming, like melting the permafrost or, you know, so there's all kinds of things that could happen that would then enhance the warming to, so that, so that's what they're arguing about. They're not arguing over the, just the basic physics. And that's why Scott, by the way, it's very disingenuous sometimes, especially like in internet arguments, when people will say something like, the basic science of climate change was established by this guy back in 1890 when he, you know, climbed a mountain and discovered. That's not what any normal person, I mean, you know, when Trump says it's all a hoax or something, yeah, maybe he doesn't know the basic chemistry and physics, but guys like at the Cato Institute who are professional climate scientists who are skeptical of these political solutions, they're certainly aware that that's not what the argument's over. It's over things like, well, as more moisture is released, you know, does that cause more cloud formation, which would reflect more sunlight? Da, 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 you know, that, that's the kind of stuff because the climate system obviously is extremely complex and there's all kinds of feedbacks and some amplify and some dampen the original, you know, warming. And that's what they're arguing about. And that's really where the crux of the debate is that if, if there's, a, like, there's a runaway, you know, positive feedback effect, then it is true that, oh, gee, if we allowed a little bit more warming, then it's going to kind of you know hit a tipping point and get away from us, and we're not going to be able to stop it. Whereas if there's like negative feedback effects, then it's the other way around. Or other people are arguing, you know, maybe there's factors that are that if it weren't for more CO2, Earth would go back into a little ice age kind of thing. And so, you know, the, if those are the kinds of things where they're arguing about to see these, you know, million different factors. It's kind of like economists arguing over, you know, the Obama stimulus package. You might think, well, can't they just look at the numbers? And no, I mean, it's so economy is so complicated, they can all come up with their different theories and fit the data into their own frameworks. And mm-hmm. it's a similar thing here, where yeah, they all have different views. The data, the historical observations are all consistent with their models because there's so many moving parts and dials you can tweak. And then, but their projections are wildly different. Right. And by the way, you know, we started out. Uh, this interview with are you corrupt working for some oil company saying the things that you say or this kind of thing it's fair to bring up the economic incentives you mentioned already exxon's incentive for supporting this narrative now but there's a lot of rent seekers in a lot of universities and a lot of god knows what institutions and government offices who are dependent upon this narrative now and that doesn't again it's a separate question from whether they're right or wrong but it sure means that they don't want to hear from your point of view either. Yeah. And let me also just follow up on that. So, yeah, I mean, there's the straightforward thing of, you know, well, gee, if if the fact that, uh, you know, an energy company might subsidize some think tank to then put out a study and everyone understands the sense in which. So now you're going to look, you know, with uh, skepticism by the same token, somebody who's getting funded by the government who comes out and advocates expanding the government's power 
for some reason, that's just viewed as legitimate science. You know, that's not, well, wait a minute. It's the same, you know, it's the that's same thing. That's democracy, man. Why do you yeah. hate freedom so much? But I, I do want to clarify. So what I'm, I'm not saying that I think the average rank and file, you know, uh, researcher is publishing stuff that he or she knows is false because ah, I'm getting a paycheck or I'm going to get that grant approved. I think it's more that somebody who, you know, they publish their literature but they they pull their punches, and certainly when they're being interviewed, the the way they express their results is very guarded. So let me give you a great example of this, Be, because they know what the conventional narrative is, and maybe they don't want to give ammunition to quote the other side. So for example, William Nordhaus, who again he it was it was beautiful the 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 timing. It was last fall, it was you know fall of 2018 when it was it was the same weekend actually the news broke that he had won the Nobel Prize in Economics for his pioneering work on climate change and the UN comes out with this document about here are steps the governments around the world could take to try to contain warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius and I like I said his own work showed that would be a ludicrously bad thing to try to get at so if someone from the New York Times um, was interviewing him about all this stuff. And, you know, I was talking about his work and, you know, in the 70s and what do you think about public awareness and blah, blah, blah. And then near the end of the interview, she asks him, so um, do you, what do you think? Are, are we going to be able to, to hit the 1.5 degrees Celsius target or is it too late? And he said, well, I'm paraphrasing, but he said something like, yeah, at this point, I think that's unrealistic that we, uh, we're not going to be able to hit that target. And he didn't then follow up with, and thank God. You know what I mean? So he... What he said was a true statement, and it was consistent with his work. But he he refrained from volunteering. By the way, my own work shows that target. It would be insane to try to achieve, and I'm glad we're not going to hit it. He just and and of course I know why he did that because he's getting the Nobel Prize. He's getting you know fed. If if he stuck his neck out and challenged that narrative, then he would have a million people at you know Huffington Post and whatever Daily Kos and all these other places, mm -hmm. Vox ripping his head off and going and saying how his model leaves out all these things that his damage function's wrong. So why would he, you know, he doesn't want to deal with that. And also since he's for a carbon tax and he knows the political resistance to it, I think the way he justified it is saying, yeah, I'll let these activists shoot for the moon because in practice, what will probably pop out of the system is something closer to what I think is correct. And so he keeps his mouth shut, even though these activists are justifying these measures with absurd projections and rhetoric and scaring the public with stuff that's not remotely accurate. You should interview this guy on your show. I should. I should. I'll, I'll, I'll ask him. Yeah. <laughs> there was a point when he was answering my email because I was like going through his model and like noticing little slight mistakes and things. Mm -hmm. Nothing that changed the, you know, but it, like as a professional courtesy, I was like, hey, you might want to check table six here of your results. There's uh -huh. a type, that kind of thing. So like, oh, thanks. Yeah, I will. But I don't, <laughs> I, but, but even here, I mean, that's the thing too, is I've noticed certain people. Um, like there's another, I won't say his name cause I don't want, you know, I can't prove this, but there's another g big researcher in this area who is more middle of the road. Mm -hmm. And I used to cite his work, you know, to show, Hey, in this guy's results, look at this. But I think, you know, he's still for some political measures. He's not a total, you know, laissez faire guy. And so I think it sort of embarrasses him or puts him in an awkward position when I quote his stuff. So, you know, again, I can't prove this stuff, but I think, it, you know, there are these different coalitions kind of like, you know, oh, well, I'm not one of those nut job people who doesn't want the government to do anything. I'm just raising. Some. Yeah. So right. it, it's it's tricky. And it's and I again, I understand the you know, in other words, these these no scientist wants Rush Limbaugh to be quoting from your working paper right. on his show because that that's embarrassing. It looks like you're feet, you know, fueling the enemy. Yeah. All right, I'm sorry. I got to go. Ron Paul's next, and I'm late. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> I'm a good warm-up for Ron Paul. Yes, very good. Uh, listen, man, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's great to talk to you again, Bob. Thanks for talking to you, Scott. All right, guys, that's Robert P. Murphy. He's at Mises.org and at the Bob Murphy Show, not the BobMurphyShow.com. Oh, and check him out on Contra Krugman with Tom Woods as well, of course. All right, y'all, thanks. Find me at LibertarianInstitute.org at scotthorton.org, antiwar.com, and reddit.com slash scotthortonshow. Oh yeah, and read my book, Fool's Errand, Timed and the War in Afghanistan, at foolserand.us.